Hi, it's Kevin again. Today I mean to get into a phrase that I've used several times in videos on image processing, finding the peaks in an array. When I've used that phrase, I've trusted that the idea would be straightforward. But of course, in programming, the details matter. Let's take a closer look. One example that we had in an earlier video created an abstract image whose peaks corresponded one to one with straight edges in an input image. We used these peaks to find the straight edges in a picture of a punched card in order to go on to find the holes and recover the data. More recently, in the last video, we used the Euclidean distance transformation to convert an image of coins to a map of values where the peaks correspond to the coins. Here we also needed the neighborhood of a peak because those neighborhoods could be used to isolate individual coins in the image. So we also need to formalize this concept of a neighborhood. Hiking clubs have pondered the definitions of peaks, which are significant maxima in elevation, for a very long time because they compile lists of mountains for people to climb. The most obvious thing to try is to find local maxima. Any point higher than its neighbors should be a peak, or any pixel brighter than its neighbors should be a peak. But this gives far too many results. Every little lump and bump on the landscape becomes a peak. The same thing happens with finding maxima in a noisy image. Every speckle becomes a peak. We need something better. The next obvious thing to try is to consider only those local maxima that exceed a given threshold. Images can get quite noisy close to the maxima, just as the mountains can get craggy close to the summits. We don't want every boulder or every speckle of noise in an image to register as a peak. What works better is to use a measure called topographic prominence. Topographic prominence tries to characterize how far a peak rises above the surrounding terrain, while elevation measures how far it is above a reference value, perhaps sea level or a reference intensity. Prominence measures how far you have to descend from a peak before you can start climbing a higher peak. In the image, we see the marked peak in the center of the image is more prominent than the one at the right, because to go to the next higher summit to the left, we have to descend into a much deeper valley than we do in getting to the center from the right. Filtering based on prominence removes all the lumps and bumps below a given size. There's one final detail. Mountains can have crevasses on their slopes, and images can have dark artifacts across bright areas. If a split is deep enough, it can give a high prominence to the outlying feature. We can sometimes get rid of these anomalies by filtering on the feature separation, which is just the Euclidean distance to the parent peak, that is, the higher peak we identified when calculating the prominence. Coming up with these definitions is a huge step towards solving the problem. Filtering on elevation, prominence, and separation takes care of most of what we need in any peak finding problem. From these ideas, it's not too hard to come up with an algorithm. What we'll use is called the watershed algorithm, particularly an implementation called priority flood. Let's replace the static image of the peaks with a 3D model and fly around for a much broader view to see how it works. The watershed algorithm got its start when cartographers needed to draw maps of the drainage basins of rivers. The maps have regions where rain that falls flows into a particular river. The lines that separate the river's basins are called watersheds, and that's where the name of the algorithm comes from. The concept is pretty simple. We imagine flooding the entire landscape gradually, and we color water according to the point where it first appeared. The different colors of water fill the different river basins. When two basins meet, we have to decide what to do. If the ridge separating them isn't high enough, we mix the water and treat the two basins as one. Otherwise, we start drawing a watershed at the point where the basins meet. We keep raising the water and making the decisions at the boundaries on the ridges. When the entire region is flooded, we've identified all the basins. If I drain the water again, you can see that the lines indicate where the water flows out in different directions, and the arrows mark where the rivers leave the region.
You might be confused at this point, because until now I was talking about peaks, not valleys. But the two are really the same problem if we turn it on its head. I'll fly in toward the mountains so that we can see more detail. We'll start with the world completely flooded. Now we'll be draining the water instead of filling it and keeping track of where the land appears. Each new bit of land that appears is a new peak. And when the regions of two peaks touch, we decide whether to merge them or keep both based on prominence and separation. Our boundaries will be valleys instead of ridges. That's basically all there is for the general concept, but we should probably take a look at more of the details of the algorithm. Once again, let me fly around to a tighter view. And focus in tightly on a small piece of the mountain range, along with a flat map of the same little area. From this view, let's look at the details of the algorithm. We'll need a few relatively simple data structures. We need a priority queue of pixels that are waiting to be processed in order by elevation, increasing if we're flooding and decreasing if we're draining. We need a couple of Boolean values per pixel to keep track of state. And we need a disjoint sets data structure, which I described in an earlier video, that will group pixels according to which mountain owns them. For each mountain, we will need to track the location of the peak and may want to keep some descriptive statistics. The algorithm setup is straightforward. We simply look for pixels that are greater than all their neighbors and greater than the elevation threshold. We mark them visited and put them on the queue. Here's the initial set of visited points for the area we're looking at. Okay, I've oversimplified a bit here. We need to watch out for equal pixels because totally flat areas cause trouble otherwise. The flat areas might come about because data have been clipped, perhaps because they've exceeded the range of some sensor, or the data may have been quantized to a set of discrete values so that a whole neighborhood might have identical values. In the original application, lakes would also cause large areas of equal elevation because, after all, water is ordinarily level. They need the same sort of processing. There are a few popular approaches to dealing with ties. They all start with grouping adjacent equal pixels into regions. Once again, the disjoint sets data structure can do all the bookkeeping. If any pixel in a region has a higher elevation neighbor, then the area isn't a flat-topped area, and the algorithm can cope with it. If all the region's neighbors are lower, then it's a plateau. We can choose a pixel arbitrarily to be the peak. Often we want it somehow to be in the middle of the region. There are a few popular definitions for that. We can choose the pixel nearest the region's centroid. The centroid itself might be outside an irregular region, so we might need to move over to the nearest pixel that's inside. A second approach is to choose the center of the longest horizontal run of pixels in the region. This is cheap to compute and often gives a usable result. A third approach is to choose the pixel farthest from the region's edges, the center of the largest inscribed circle. This is popular with cartographers. It could be found using the Euclidean distance transform that we saw in the last video. But if you search the internet for a maximal inscribed circle, you'll find faster algorithms for that problem. And maybe someday I'll do a video on them. Which approach will be the best depends on the details of what you want to do with the peaks. For this video, it doesn't matter. The data that I have contain flat areas only on the lakes. There are not nearly as many details to worry about in the main body of the algorithm. It's actually quite straightforward. We pull a pixel off the priority queue and look for neighbors that have been assigned to peaks. We list all the neighbor peaks that are at least the prominence threshold above the current altitude. There may be none, one, or multiple ones. If there are multiple ones and they can't be enclosed in a circle whose diameter is the separation threshold, then we do nothing with the current pixel. It lies on a watershed. Otherwise, we merge the current pixel with all the neighboring peaks. 
Finally, all unprocessed neighbors get added back to the priority queue. Let's watch this run on the actual data. The first pixel off the queue is the highest summit in the region. It has no neighbors that belong to peaks, so the enclosing circle test is true vacuously. We create the data structure for the peak. We still don't have any assigned neighbors. We mark the current pixel as being assigned to a peak, and we add its neighbors to the queue. So now we have one peak marked with a blue square and an arrow, and a ring of pixels around it, highlighted in white, have been added to the queue. One of those is the next one off the queue. This time there's a unique neighboring peak. It's likely below the prominence threshold relative to this neighbor, but in either case, it'll be within the required separation, or the condition will be true vacuously. We'll therefore merge this pixel with the neighbor peak, mark it assigned, and queue up the neighbors. When we've done that a few times, a second summit comes to the front. Once again, we create a peak for it and queue the neighbors. The same thing happens with the next peak. And the next. This time, the peak is a false summit of very little prominence. We do create a peak for it, but then we find another local maximum two pixels away and is at nearly the same elevation. When we process their common neighbor, we now will do the union operation once for each of these little local peaks, merging them. Pretty soon, that region has grown to border the mountain to its south, and we find that we again have two neighbors with prominence below the threshold. Once again, we merge the peaks. When we get to this point, we come to the first place where we have two neighboring peaks, both meeting the prominence threshold. They cannot be enclosed within a small enough circle, so we do nothing but queue the neighbors. Moving forward, here's a place where the prominence is enough, but the separation isn't. We have two neighboring peaks, but they do fit in a circle smaller than the separation threshold. So we merge them. Down here we come to an interesting case. There are a lot of higher neighbors, but none of them meets the elevation threshold. The priority queue still manages that nicely. The effect is that the algorithm races to the summit of the small hill, and then it fills the area down to the previous waterline. Once it's down there, it continues lowering the water as before. When the entire region is mapped out, the priority queue becomes empty and the algorithm terminates. In this little region, we're left with five peaks and the lines of the valleys that separate them. Now let's come back to our example of recognizing coins in an image like this one. Our first task is to separate the coins from the background. I took this picture against a green screen, so that's pretty easy. One favorite metric I have for figuring out which pixels are green screen is a simple linear function that gives green a positive weight and red and blue negative weights. It works well here. The background has very high greenness and the coins are very dark against it. A simple thresholding operation followed by some light denoising gives us a clean separation between foreground and background. Now we calculate the Euclidean distance transform to measure how far points in the coins are from a point in the background. We've seen how to calculate this in an earlier video. There should be a link somewhere nearby. If you view the Euclidean distance from each pixel to the background as a height, it makes each coin into a little conical hill. The borders come out visually more attractive if we don't have a totally flat background. So we also compute the Euclidean distance of background pixels to the nearest coin and subtract that from our distance function. Foreground pixels will have positive distances, background pixels will have negative distances. Now we're ready to run the watershed algorithm. It runs just as we've seen before, identifying the peaks which are the centers of the coins. Where the coins overlap in the image, 
It traces a border between the overlapping coins. The result is that we have mapped out the image into areas corresponding to the coins, with at least plausible lines tracing the boundaries where the coins touch. It's easy to see how we can get descriptive statistics about the individual coins from a map like this. In this particular example, we are able to identify the coins by size. The diameters of pennies, nickels, dimes, and quarters are distinct. The height of the peak and the distance transformation is the radius of the coin in pixels. When I tried this on a larger sample, I found out there was enough measurement noise in the coin sizes that it didn't tell pennies from dimes reliably. But pennies are redder than the other coins. I fixed the problem by making the test to tell pennies from dimes take into account both size and color, using the redness function shown here. Plotting the data points showed clusters with much more space between them, and it was easy to make a function to label them. Before we go, I want to make a few more remarks. The watershed algorithm, unless you're using separation, is much more general than it appears at first, because it doesn't depend on very many properties of the space. You can use it in any space where you have some sort of value defined at each point. All it needs is a definition of adjacency. The space can be n-dimensional. It doesn't need to be rectilinear. I've used the watershed algorithm on triangular meshes. It doesn't even need to be Euclidean, as long as there is a definition of neighbor that makes sense. For instance, when we were looking in a previous video at finding straight lines in an image, a major piece of that was finding maxima in a parameter space that connected to itself with a half twist. The red arrows at the ends of the diagram show how the two ends join to make a continuous Möbius strip. As long as the for each neighbor iteration can take this unusual connection into account, the watershed algorithm works perfectly. And that's just about all I have to say about the watershed algorithm for the moment. Next time, I'll try to cover some other interesting bit of computer vision, so stay tuned. In the meantime, stay safe, stay curious, and keep calculating. <laughs>